All right, so I'm here with Ensign Anoy and this is Todd Atkins, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something today that you know Ensign has had some experience with, good and bad experience. And uh, so we're talking about King Reyna, who Reyna Miura, right? Miura, who was arrested in Japan recently uh, with a YouTuber, I think that she's dating or something. And so Ensign has some experience you know, with Japanese law enforcement. So maybe talk about what you know about this arrest, first of all, or how much publicity it's getting. I pretty much only know what's in the paper. So apparently she was uh, with the YouTuber in his apartment, I think it was. And they were caught with three grams. Oh. Three grams. <laughs> but why do you think they were caught, like, because they had like this uh, clothing line, apparently, that they had made like a pro marijuana clothing line. Did the cops just come up there or what happened? Well, the um, yeah, the clothing line definitely um, was probably a red flag for the cops. But for the police to actually go into her house, there got to have been people who actually uh, were witnesses that say that she has and is put is in possession of marijuana. Yeah, the, like did it because she she was at the YouTuber's place, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe like an apartment. I yeah, so think. so the, the the probability of it that they were arrested at his place was probably that there are reports of him having possession of marijuana, and she probably just happened to be there and was arrested with him. So, I mean. There's a, probably a good chance that uh, the guy will take the fall and she'll probably be released. Because, like, if you live in an apartment building, you're smoking it. Like, his neighbors would probably say, this guy's smoking pot on our floor or whatever. Yeah, that that probably is one of the probably biggest possibilities that they the neighbors uh, reported to the police that they can smell marijuana. And that's probably, for, for Japan, it's amazing because that's enough reason for the police to actually go and arrest you. I actually, there was once that I actually got arrested for uh, assault when I didn't do it, but the guy claimed that I beat him up, broke his nose, and I didn't do it. But the, I had seven cops come, in, come to my house like at seven in the morning, and they, they actually took me, put me in their police car, and they took me all the way down to the police station in Tokyo. Just because some guy said that I beat him up. So that's the way Japan works, man. So, like, kind of tell people what happened with yours and what you think. Are they going to be held, like, accountable to the level that you were or no, you think? Well, what's going to probably happen is right now, um, I think they're arrested, like, on the 3rd, yeah? So around around now, she probably be getting out. She probably just got out. So in Japan, the, the crazy thing about the law in Japan is you can get arrested by suspicion without no evidence. But what the cops have is they have a rule where if there's a, if someone claims that you did something or you have marijuana, they can legally arrest you with no evidence and they can hold you for 20 days. And, and the crazy thing about Japan is when you're being hold, held, you're actually, you know, like how they say you're you're innocent until proven guilty. In Japan, it's like the opposite. You're guilty until proven innocent. Like when you were approached, why do you think it happened the way it did? Because they approached you in public, right? Yeah, well, there's there's some rumors that maybe I was targeted. Um, it was uh, I wasn't really hiding the fact that I like marijuana and I smoke marijuana. So there's a chance that um, I was targeted. Uh, there's also another chance that they randomly um, in Japan. They, if you're sitting in the parking lot, you know, in, in, in the hundred yen parking lots, it's a suspicious thing to them. So I, that's what I was doing. I was actually on my space on my computer in the parking lot, sitting in the parking lot. So, so they, um, so they, they might have that. I think it's just a random thing. They came up to check out my car. I was sitting in the car. They From my car window, they could see a roach on my dashboard. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, what is that? And that's pretty much how it happened. 
So kind of tell people what your experience was when, when this all went down. Yeah. So what happened was when they asked me what that was and they got it, they, they brought a test kit. And as soon as they tested it and it was positive for marijuana, um, it was a huge thing. Had like a couple detectives come out, had a couple squad cars come out. It was a big scene. I was sitting in the parking lot. They had cops all around me. They, they put me in the cop car and took me down to the jail cell. And it was pretty much a, a, like a huge investigation. I was put into jail and I was held. Uh, first, first three days, I couldn't see anybody but my lawyer. And I went into a three-day interrogation for about eight hours a day about where I got it who I got it from threatening me that I'm going to be in jail for six to seven years. If I don't tell them what, who I got it from, uh, confiscated my phone, went through my whole phone. Um, then, then the investigation went on to the people in my phone. How come there's these Yakuza guys in their phone? And, and I mean, it was crazy. I, they wanted me to, then they actually asked me about kid. They asked me about kid. They said, uh, um, doesn't he smoke marijuana? And I, at the time, actually had a falling out with kid. But for me, that wasn't how I, I run. I wasn't going to talk about him. I wasn't going to tell him about him. I said, you know, you guys do your job. I said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, a, I'm not a part of him. He, back, he backstabbed me. I don't really care what happens to him, but I'm not going to help you guys do that. That's your job. So, yeah, so I went, I went to a huge interrogation. I was being threatened. Uh, in Japan, marijuana is not just marijuana. Marijuana is considered the same as cocaine, ice, heroin. So holding, having a, you know, possession of marijuana, whether it's one gram or, or one pound, you're, you're, you're being charged like you're holding meth. Now, when they came out, you were, they kind of aggressive. Like I remember one time I was Ryan and he was putting up posters for like English lessons. And I remember this cop approached us and he actually pushed Ryan. Like, what are you doing? You know, he pushed him. Yeah. How were they with you? Were they cordial? No, or? they didn't. They didn't. They had no hands on me, but they pretty much uh, came in, wouldn't let me call, wouldn't let me touch my phone. I mean, really, really aggressive. But for me, it wasn't physical at all, but really aggressive. Yeah, they're really aggressive. They're, they're talked down on you. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is when you're in, when you go to the jail cell, you're handcuffed. And then the only time you can uh, go out of the cell when you go to the courts, you get handcuffed and you get um, all the inmates that's going to court that day get 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 a, a, a rope going through all of them. And they're walking in a line like the movies. When you get to the jail cell, you, you're um, you're sitting in a concrete room with six people on each side facing each other. You can't talk. And the whole day you have handcuffs on you when you eat. You know, when you eat, your hand, you're in your hands in handcuffs. So if you want to eat they, for, for, for lunch, they gave you uh, two, two slices of bread with jam and a drink. That's all you get. And when you eat, you eat the sandwich, you got to eat the sandwich. If you want to get a drink, you got to put the sandwich down and you got to grab your drink and then you got to drink. So you're, you're pretty much in handcuffs the whole day. They treat you like shit. They talk to you like shit. You know, they call you by numbers. And then they, they, if you talk, they, they scream at you and say, shut up. When they call you, when they call you, they tell you, okay, this show, get up. I mean, it's like the movies, man. It's crazy. But are the inmates like scared of them? Like, you know, the U.S., the inmates kind of run these facilities. It's not like that there. Not at all. The inmates are actually pawns in the, in the, in the whole game. You know, they're, they're nothing. They're, they're just being controlled. I mean, in the Japan, they, they say the Japan prisons are real bad because of the freedom you get in there. So when I was in the holding cells, I was in jail. Uh, they told you, you had they tell you what you have to do. You have to, when you eat, when you sleep, when you get books, when you got to give your pen up. What, I mean, even even like to a point where you could wash laundry only once a week and you only could shower once every five days. It's controlled. It's a whole, you're controlled the whole time. Everything's controlled. You talk too much, they come tell you, shut up. The only thing you can ask for is water or hot water. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy um, controlled system that 
you know, and, and when you're in the cell, they come to your cell about three to four times every day. Like it's a, it's a, like a closed cell that you're not going anywhere, but they come in and count, count the inmates. They'll have a, a list of uh, who, who is in there and you have to stand up when they come to the cell and they'll call you numbers. Like I was number 39. So they say 39, you got to say hi. And then this goes 27. The guy goes hi. So you line up and you, I mean, they come by your, just randomly come by your cell and you got to stand up and count and they count you and you got to, you got to answer. So it's a real strict, real, real um, environment with absolutely no freedom. And you ended up spending what a year, right? No, I only spent it 20, 28 days, man. Oh, 28 days. Yeah. And she, she the thing people look at it and say, 28 days ain't shit. But when you're in there and you're you thinking that you're going to be there for six, seven years, I mean, if, if I knew from the beginning, you're only going to be in 28 days and you're going to be slapped with four years probation and a suspended sentence of two years. I would have been like, oh, fuck, 28 days, shit. I'll enjoy this time. But when you're in there and the way they're threatening you and the way they're, the investigation goes, the way they're trying to make you squeal on people, and if you don't squeal, you're going to get hit hard. They give you all this bullshit. Like, oh, you know, in Japan, there's no plea bargain. You can't, you can't like, say something and you'll get a lighter sentence. They, they try, to, try to pretend that you will be treated better if you, if you give them information, but it's not like that. So, you know, they... they they grill you. They, they 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 stress you out, man. They tell you you're not gonna you're not gonna be out for a long time. You're not gonna see our friends anymore. You know they, they give you all these threats, and you know when you're in there. Frick, I remember. I mean, every day was like, fuck. This is it, man. This is this is a. Uh, I'm gonna be here for a long time. And in Japan, the worst thing about Japan is your reputation's freaking smashed. So like King Reina, whatever she had in YouTube or whatever she had in any type of TV deal or sponsorship, they're all gone. Now, do you think they're going to face kind of similar time to you as far as what they'll get offered? Yeah, well, I had 20 grams, um, but she has she was with three. If she claims that that was hers or they both claimed, or nobody claims that it was theirs, they're both going to get charged for it. And yeah, she's going to be facing the exact same things I went through. You know, for me... I got hit harder because I was a foreigner. So after I had my court case, I had I was um I got released, but I was um, got put on four years probation with a two year suspended sentence. Um, they I got a call from immigration. I had a green card at the time. The green card got canceled, and you know I was I've been there I think at least like fifteen years, and I already had a house and everything. I've already bought this house. And they wanted to me to leave in three months straight up. The immigration sent me a letter saying uh, you have to leave the country in three months because your green card has been canceled. So if you want to cont contest it, call this number. So I called the number and they told me, OK, uh, if you want to contest it, you have to come in for uh, uh, for like an interview to for some type of evaluation. When I went to an evaluation, I didn't know, but they actually were thinking of putting me in there's a holding cell in the immigration office so almost like a prison in immigration and there was a dilemma whether they're going to hold me the fact that i've been here for so long the fact that i was a famous name and the fact that i actually owned the house allowed me to i wasn't a a, a flight risk so they allowed me to be out the the investigation lasted for eight months so if i wasn't a if i was a flight risk they would have held me for eight months in the in the immigration holding cells. And I went through immigration um, uh, interrogation. I, I had to go in, in the eight months, I had to go in for um, three, 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 oh, three interviews, which lasted about eight hours each. And I wasn't allowed to leave my prefecture. So I'm in Saitama Prefecture. I wasn't allowed to leave Saitama. If I had to leave Saitama, I had to go in every single month to the immigration office and I had to tell them what for for work what um, different prefectures I was going to be going to so what happens then is if I don't tell them that I'm going to Tokyo and I go to Tokyo and I get into I get a ticket or I get any any legal problems in Tokyo even if I get into a small scuffle and the police is called it's an infringement of my probation the other thing they had in the probation was 
in Japan, if you're serving probation, you can't go. I can't go back to Hawaii for a year and spend a year there because they want to make sure I'm in Japan and I'm being a good boy for that four years and serving my probation. So I wasn't allowed to leave the country for the four years. And if I left the country, I was not going to ever be allowed back. So I actually had to miss my grandmother's funeral. So, I mean, it, it, that's the way they, they work here. So King Reina is going to, is probably getting out around now. And she's either going to be with the evidence that they investigated. She probably went to heavy interrogation. They're, they're going to decide whether she's, it's, in, it's enough evidence to have a court case. There's a chance one, she might just be released with no no charges. And you know when they release you, if, if they, um, I had a guy, a Yakuza guy in my cell that was arrested in Hokkaido for a suspicion of being a part of some kind of fraud. He got arrested. He sat in the jail for like 20 days. He was already in there when I was there. So he got released before me. And pretty much after he got released, it was kind of like, oh, we don't have evidence on you. You can go now. They, they went and arrested him in Hokkaido, flew him all the way down to Tokyo. Didn't even give him a chance to grab his uh, cash cards or money or anything. And they brought him to Tokyo. When they found no evidence, said, okay, you can go now. And they let him out of the jail in Tokyo with no money. And that's how they do it. No sorry. You know, the police here have, have they feel like they're they're like almost God. They 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 don't need to tell you sorry. You know, it's it's a real it's a real crazy thing they have here. And in in America, if they ran it there in America, it would be hundred percent unconstitutional and a lot of their arrests wouldn't be possible. So yeah, so that's what's probably happening to her. She she probably got taken into jail, whatever wherever she was. If it was Tokyo, she got into the Tokyo cells. She went through that 20 day process where she had to go to court and was probably handcuffed all day eating a sandwich and a drink uh you know you know when you know you go to the court courts you get into a, a prison cell and then you get held for i showed you like six people sitting inside you can't even talk if you talk they'll scream at you to shut up and you're pretty much there from uh eight in the morning to 5 p.m in the evening sitting on the con concrete chair sitting straight up not being able to talk crazy crazy system do you think they'll treat her different because she's a Japanese national? No, we're all treated the same. Foreigners, Japanese national, we're all treated the same. We're all treated as, you know, I guess, you know, if, if you're a normal citizen, of course, you know, Japan, as we all know, they're prejudiced to their own people. They, they, they take care of their own people. They'll treat foreigners a lot different. But I guess in jail, if you're, whether you're Japanese or not, you're considered a bad person. You're treated like shit. You're treated like a criminal. You're you you know you line up. You get handcuffed. You, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I'm sta I was standing here in the in the cells thinking, holy shit, this is crazy. I'm not even convicted guilty yet. They're investigating my case. I could actually be hundred percent innocent, and they're investigating and might find no evidence. If I mean, of course, they found me with marijuana, so my case was different. But there's a lot of guys in there that was just arrested on suspicion, and they're treated exactly like a murderer. A, like me, someone who was holding drugs. And I mean, it's crazy. The, the way they, they, they have the liberty to treat you in any way when they have suspicion. And, you know, I, I, as you know, living in Japan, Todd, they, they can come here and search you without any cause. Yeah, that's what the guy did. Uh, I said that Push Ryan, he wasn't even in a police uniform. He was plain clothes. Came up, shoved him, asked him what he why he was putting these flyers up. And then when, you know, he asked him, what are you doing? Why, what do you do here in Japan? You know, so Ryan told him I'm a fighter. Ball. And then he kind of started acting different after that. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, well, yeah, well, I, do, I do judo. You know, he, he started acting a little different. He said, mm -hmm. take these down right now. Take them all down. There, there was also an incident where I was in, a, in a Akihabara. And a cop came up to me and they wanted to see my wallet and see what I have in my pockets. And I, at first I was like, fuck you. I said, well, I didn't do shit. Why do you have to look, show you anything? And I actually have a right not to do that, but what they'll do is, so what ha What ended up happening, there was five cops that got called. Uh, they wanted to get, you know, they, it was a big scene. And if I, I could have held my ground, but what would have happened is it would have took hours and hours and they would have eventually got a, a search warrant on me and they would have came to my house. So what I did was I said, you know what? I have I have nothing bad, so I I let him see my wallet, 
at the time I had a sponsor that gave me their a cash card where they put money in and they, I could I could uh, free have, I had the freedom to withdraw money from the cash card and the, of course the name isn't my name the name was the lady's uh, cash card so they go through all my cards man they look at all the names they go, oh how come you have somebody else's name I say it's one of my sponsors I have her card because I can take out the money I have the pin code everything you know what they wanted they wanted me to call her they wanted me to call her and wanted me, and it's still, you You don't even know who you're calling. I could have had that set up and tell somebody to pretend to be that person in case I get arrested. So I actually had to call her. She went on the phone with them, told them, yes, this is me. That's my cash card. I'm sponsoring Anson, and, and, and they let it go. But it's crazy, man. They go to every little nitty-gritty detail to try and get you. And I would assume her fighting in deep or whatever, that's done. Probably. Oh, yeah, but of course, if she gets uh, released with no charges, um, like fighting associates are probably a lot more lenient. She'll probably be able to fight again. But as far as like any type of commercial TV, any type of talent agency, she'd probably drop for at least seven years. But I mean, like if they tried to deny that it was theirs, like, oh, it's his. No, it's hers. They can drug test them, can they not? Did they try to no. drug test you? Oh. Okay, this is the deal now. In Japan, at the time that I got arrested, being drug tested for marijuana and having marijuana in your system wasn't a, it wasn't a charge at all. If you had uh, ice or cocaine and they tested you, you don't even need to have the cocaine, you'll get arrested. But for marijuana, at the time, it was only possession. Like, you know, they suspected a kid was uh, smoking marijuana and had, had marijuana. Unless they could catch him with marijuana, they couldn't grab him on suspicion and test him. Because even if he tested positive, they couldn't arrest him. But what I just heard, I think a couple years ago, they've actually made it where marijuana is the same as cocaine and ice, where if you have it in your system, you're arrested. So you're right. Okay, so now what I was saying was she'll probably be released if this, if the guy takes a fall. Now, it, now how it is currently, they probably tested her. Oh, God, sorry. So right now, currently, what probably happened was they probably tested her. She, Of course, you know, marijuana stays in her system for a long time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then she was probably, yeah, and she was probably tested positive. And so she probably got, a, she, okay, so she's probably going to get a charge. She's going to get a charge for um marijuana. Yeah, because so I would probably, assume these she people. Has, she definitely has it in her system. Yeah, I would assume these people are regular smokers if they're making clothing lines, marijuana yeah. clothing lines. It's. Not hard to put two and two together, even if they didn't smoke at that time, which they probably did. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think marijuana, <laughs> if, just if you're an avid smoker, it'll stay in you for for yeah. months. Yeah. So yeah, she yeah. Like, you know, so with that said, I think she's probably uh, getting a charge. Um, it'll probably update the the paper should be updated pretty soon on what well, her because she was arrested on the third. You call it twenty so the. 23 days it's already been 26 days the 27th today here in japan so i was held for 28 days so there's a because she's famous there's a possibility there's going to have problems on a bail and if she can't post bail then she'll be held until her court case which could be a couple of years how that's, much of the bail being, you think that's not being proven guilty yet now <laughs> how much would the bail be you think um, uh, mine was thirty thousand. So her being famous, it'll probably be close to that, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and she would have to post the bail. Yeah, or someone could post it for her. And in Japan, you have to post the full bail, not like the U.S. Full system. Bail. No, you don't get like this, like these criminals that have no money getting out on like a, you know, half their bail or a tenth of their bail. You know, it's like yeah. you got to post post the full thing, almost like federal. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about, like, because this is something I wanted to ask you, like, I saw some of that when I was there. I always thought it was kind of like maybe people wanting to be westernized or whatever, but, you know, people with the pro-marijuana clothing or, you know, Rastafarian, you know, don't you think it just draws attention, you know, that especially if oh, you're yeah. famous? 
Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, you. If, yeah, if you're you're into the like, like in Japan when you're into trance, you're you're it's considered you're you're probably a druggie. You'll probably be on the radar. Yeah. So Rastafari, you know, you know, being pro marijuana, even if you don't have it or smoke it, um, that's definitely going to be put you on the radar. Yeah, I think if they had ever went up into that gym, the kid might have been it. Yeah, I mean. Because that one smelled like pot from time to time. You know, they could have walked up in there anytime. Yeah, but the thing is, is they even if they walked up there or even sent people in plain clothes to pretend like they're members or wanting to join the gym, smelling it and finding actual marijuana in the gym is two different things. So, oh, okay. you know, they could have, they could smoke it somewhere, stash it somewhere, walk in the gym, and you know, marijuana, once you smoke it, you're going to reek marijuana. So you can smell it. I mean, I could be, I could have smoked marijuana, and and smoked the whole joint, throw it away, walk around, smell like marijuana. The police will come to me, say you got marijuana. They'll search me, no marijuana. They can't arrest me just by smell, just that type of suspicion. Well, now they can. So now apparently they can arrest you and take a drug test, and once you get positive for marijuana, they can actually put a charge on you. And I would assume now you're not publicly pro marijuana or anything anymore, right? Well, um, yeah, I of course on my social media there's no mention of marijuana on it. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's a it's a it's a harmless drug. I believe it's very good for people. Uh, there's a lot of municipal properties in it, and but yeah, of course I don't discuss it. Uh, if anyone talks to me about marijuana, I say no, I I don't do it anymore. I. I don't like I, I I after I got arrested I I don't like marijuana anymore and, and my whole line is yeah I, which is kind of true is I don't like the munchies man the munchies get me fat so yeah I I don't smoke anymore plus they kind of like to give you attention from time to time as you said you know they approach you anyway sometimes yeah I mean they approach me on just uh, how I look if they see tattoos. I, I apparently look like a gangster or, or some kind of Yakuza guy, a big, I'm, I have bald head, I, I look scary. So, yeah, they'll approach me just out of nothing. And they'll, you know, I'm, I'm like a walking target. And when I used to drive a Mercedes Benz, it was even worse. They'll pull you over for no reason just because you have a Mercedes Benz. When you were locked up, did any of these underworld figures that you knew try to help you at all? When I was locked up, I was treated super good by the other prisoners because a lot of them knew who I was. And, you know, it's funny because in in prison, they have they have this real crazy grapevine that goes around. I don't know how they find out stuff, but when I was in prison, I was, you know, they knew who I was. They knew I was arrested. And, and for some reason, you know, marijuana isn't frowned upon in prison, of course. In, in American prison, if you you do if you rape or you have child molestation, anything like that, you're targeted. Like, like but drugs it doesn't, especially marijuana, it's not a drug like they're gonna you're gonna be frowned upon with within the prisoner. So yeah, I was treated super good. Um, I was uh, you know they would we, we would get magazines, and they would pass magazines to me. There was one prisoner, a yakuza prisoner, that actually came and. I had a hard time sleeping, so I was asking the prison, the guards if they could somehow get me sleeping pills. I said no. So I guess one of the prisoners next door, a Yakuza prisoner, this guy Nakagawa, he heard me asking them. And he one day, he when he was having his um, exercise time, he walked over to my cell, stuck his hand into my cell with a, um, with a Kleenex. And I was like, what is this? He was, he could, they call me champion. He said, champion for you, champion. And so I held up my hand, he dropped it in my hand, had like five sleeping pills in it. And I was like, holy shit, how the hell did you get that? Man? You know? Yeah, I was treated really well With the, yes. within the prisoners. The, 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 the guards just treated everybody like, 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 like they're looking down on you like you're a child. How much press is this arrest getting? Because she's not as big as some of the fighters were, obviously. Uh, well, I think her name is enough that is getting a lot of press. It'll make all the Yahoo News. It'll make all the TV stations. Yeah, it's big enough that she's big enough that um, it's a big thing. And you know, the funny thing is when you get arrested and if you're famous, 
it's a it's a um it's a big prop to the police that they arrested someone famous. So they'll actually call the media. They're the ones who actually put the story out. Even for my story, when my story went out, they're the ones who called the media and informed the media that they have me under arrest. I mean, the a day after I was arrested, when I was going to the courts, there were cameras outside the cell. When you're walking from the jail cell to the bus to to go to the courts. There was a whole line of cameras that were there in the morning. And when I was coming back to the jail cell in the evening, there were cameras lined up there too. And it's, it's a crazy thing. Did you have any foreigners in there with you? Like Americans or anything? No, I had no, I was the only oh. foreigner in there. Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's an, you know, I appreciate taking time to discuss this. I mean, I think it's interesting to kind of get your perspective on all this, you know, and uh, do do people still like give you a hard time about it today, or anybody? Do you notice I've never, any negativity? I've never had a hard time about from anyone about marijuana. Um, I've it's been uh, Jesus Christ, I don't know how long it's been about at least like fifteen years. So as far as uh, any a uh, type of ban on me or any type, uh, TV has no problem with me now. Magazines have no problem with me now. But the crazy thing is, uh, in my passport, there's a I don't know how long it's going to be there, but it's been already been over 15 years. But I still have a paper in my passport that says that I've been arrested for a drug charge and explains the whole situation. So now when I go through immigration, whenever I come, will leave Japan or I go into Japan, when you go to the immigration, they check out your passport where they usually just stamp it and let you go. They have they, every single time now they call an officer from the back. They come to the podium. They'll drag me to the back room. And I, it's like not a big deal. They don't like interrogate me or anything, but I pretty much sit in the back room till they process my passport in a different way because I have that paper. So whenever I go through immigration, most people will, you know, if there's no line. Most people will go through in like three minutes. I'll take at least 20 minutes to go through because they'll pull me to the back and make me wait and process my passport. So that's the, one of the things that I, 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 I joke around with them. I tell them, fuck, I said, this is 12 years ago. How long? How much longer I'm going to have to go through this process every time I come in and leave the country? You guys know I'm good already. And the guy said, oh, I don't know, man. They just kind of look at, they kind of know me already at the airports because of that. I always see them in the back. And they kind of was like, well, we don't know how long, man. Maybe for, I said, maybe forever. He said, yeah, possibly. I'm like, holy shit. That's crazy. You never get forgiven here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so I appreciate you taking time to discuss it, you know, kind of giving your perspective and, uh, Maybe tell people what you're up to. You know, I know you're doing some stuff on YouTube yourself. Yeah, I got a YouTube channel. Um, it's actually a, it's just a fun thing that I started. Um, I'm on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, everything. Uh, right now, I also have a, a bracelet company that I make parcel and bracelets. DestinyForever.com. You know, it sells it online. I have a shop in Hawaii. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm training students. So... My, my student, Fighting and Rising, Sadari Yoshi, he fights uh, on April 29th. So, yep, that's pretty much my life still. Martial arts, watch every UFC there is. And I'm a fan of martial arts, uh, you know, and have make bracelets. How much do you think, you know, Sadari, I know he's having another fight here. Kind of tell me what where he's at right now, you think, as far as well, development. He's in, a, he's in a real important part of his career right now because he – he took a real huge loss to um, a junior Tafa in his last fight. So, you know, the way he lost, he turned his back. He got broken, um, emotionally got broken in that fight. So right now in Japan, it's like a 50-50, like, uh, he's not good. But uh, no, he's still good. And it's crazy because his next fight is probably going to be his toughest fight. I mean, Tafa was super dangerous on the standing, but as far as, Strategy wise, Tafa, you could get him to the ground and he had no ground. But uh, he's fighting Rocky Martinez. And as you know, Mar Rocky Martinez was in the UFC, solid fighter. So going to the ground or standing, Rocky's a full, full fledged MMA fighter. So tough as, tough as nails, too. So uh, I this is, a, this is a huge fight. And I mean, for me, win or lose, it doesn't matter. As long as he fights hard and gives everything he got, you know, shows his heart in it. So, I mean, this fight really could go either way. Rookie, Rookie could break him standing. Rookie could take him down and control him on the ground. Shoshi could take Rookie down and get on top and control him. Shoshi could knock out Rookie standing. You know, it's one of those things that uh, 
is really up in the air in this fight. It's it's not an easy fight. It's a tough fight for him. I think it's a tough fight for both fighters. And you know, as you know, Rookie's trained by Malcolm and Busan, which is my student. And you know, when when the fight was uh, was uh, proposed to us, I actually touched base with Melker, and we talked about it and said, you know, hey, this is a sport. Um, let's have a great fight, enjoy it, and you know, maybe train together later on in the in the future. But this is a big opportunity for Roki. Um, this is a huge test for Tsuyoshi, which is really good for him. Instead of fighting a a no name, he's fighting a big name in Japan. Roki's a huge name in Japan, so we agreed that hey. Um, not personal. I get to see you in Japan. Let's, let's, let's have our students try to kill each other and maybe go party after. So me and Malker touch base is all good. We understand what's happening. And my, in, a, in a little over a month, man, it's, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great fight. Looking forward to it. How much has Sidario developed? since? like, I remember talking to you when he was kind of just starting where you think he's at right now. Oh, he's gotten a lot better. His striking's a lot better. He knows range. You know, he's a he's a phenomenal athlete. So he picks stuff up really fast. So he's picking up stuff three times faster than any normal fighter. And his ground is good. He he's got a he's got a full game. He's got good takedowns. He's got good groundwork. He knows how to get up. He knows how to defend chokes. He knows how to do arm bars and chokes. So people think he has no ground, but he has a lot of good. He has good ground. So anywhere this fight goes, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a good fight. Now does he a hey guy is he's taking it real serious? Does he train all the time or that's his whole life, man? It's his whole life trains every day. And you know, um about five days of the week I'm training him or training with him. The other times he goes like to a boxing coach, he goes to a um a facility for strength training. You know, he 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 moves around and does stuff on his own too, but most majority of the time, especially the you know the grappling and the striking and the the game plan, he's all doing it with me. So in fact, I, after this interview, in an hour, I got to take off and go to Tokyo because we're meeting up for a for a training session with him. But how different is it with him because he came from sumo, not really from a background that you would normally expect a guy to come from. Yeah, well, um, sumo. You know, he was an athlete, but Sumo really has no correspondence. As you know, Ake Bono tried to fight. He has no help. It doesn't help you in fighting. But I think what he, the privilege he has is he was an athlete. Whether it was Sumo, he was actually a basketball player. So, you know, with the with the, with the ability to have that, you know, the, that good, um, you know, movement. And as, as an athlete, he, he picks up stuff really fast and he moves really well for a big boy. He he. He does stuff that um, lightweights do as a heavyweight. So, um, but of course, with that said, he's very, very um, inexperienced. He has, he's only been fighting for two years now, Come, starting from zero. Sumo doesn't help your fighting. It's not like he was doing judo or wrestling. He was coming from a sport that had no link to MMA. So, you know, two years, man, you, you really think about it. Because he fought like tomato cans in the beginning, he fought pro wrestlers that made him look really good. All the people thought he was a lot better than he actually is. He actually thought he was a lot better than he is. He he wanted he's the one who wanted to strike with Tafa. I was against it, but he wanted to strike. So he actually had a little wake up call thing, and I, I had to sit him down and tell him, "Hey, Yoshi, why are you disappointed? You struck with one of the best kickboxers in the MMA game. Tafa was contracted by Glory, which is the best kickboxing association in the world, for three years." And you're going to strike with him after being in Japan and being in MMA for two years? I said, what do you, what, what, I mean, you're disappointing. You taught too much of yourself. You thought you took Tafa for granted. You thought you were better than you actually are. Just get back, get your feet on the ground and realize that you're still a freaking beginner and you got to start training from scratch again. And I think, I feel like in this, in this camp, he's really got back to his roots and, and came back down to girth and that has, is that humble boy again. I mean, he was really getting a little bit uh, too conceited about his ability. So I, I feel like the loss is really good for him. As, as a person and as a martial artist, it's a good wake-up call. You couldn't talk him out of that? Um, No. Well, you know, the thing is, is that kid does shit that just surprises you. And for me, I, I'm his coach, but I don't tell him what to do. I guide him on what he's doing. And when he, when I came, as soon as I heard we're fighting Tafa, I sent him, I was in Hawaii. 
when I was coming home the next week, so I messaged him and said, okay, we're going to work on striking to clinch, clinch to take down, and, and ground control. And he goes, okay. As soon as I got home, I don't know, I guess the people he was sparring with, he was really, like, beating them up. And he he came and told me, I want to strike with him. I'm like, you want to strike with Junior Tough? He goes, yes. I said, ooh. I said, and, and, you know, it was a hard thing for me because I was in a dilemma with, that's what I would have wanted to do. I would, if I saw Tafa, I would have struck with him. But see, the thing with the difference with me is I didn't care about winning or losing. I was in there to test myself and, and to take Tafa to the ground and control him on the ground wasn't a test for me. The test was to go into his strength and throw down with him. And, and the difference with me too is when I went into that fire, I would not have backed, I would not have turned my head, turned around and ran away. I would have went and fought until he knocked me out. And, you know, if Shoshi did that, he would have been, his stock would have went up crazy. But he's about, you know, the new generation, they're about for, they want to win. And if you wanted to win, striking with Junior Tafo was not what you wanted to do. And it didn't help that he didn't shake his hand in the, at the press conference. <laughs> when he, we were, I was watching the press conference in the stands and him and Junior were facing up and he didn't shake Junior's hand. I was like, oh my God, why is he doing that? Why, I mean, why is he disrespecting MMA and disrespecting Junior Tafel like that. Junior Tafel was a, a class act, <laughs> stuck his hand up to shake his hand, and he snobbed him. I was like, oh, fuck. That does not look good for us. <laughs> so, yeah, I think he's learned a lot, and I think he's got his feet back on his ground. So, um, kind of interesting to see what's going to happen in this next fight. It's really a toss-up. Rocky Rocky's a tough fighter. It's going to be a war, man. It's going to be exciting. Is, is Ryzen kind of coming up more now? Like a the old days a little bit or what do you think yeah rising is doing well um i i i don't really understand their direction they're going like they're associated with floyd mayweather the amount they have to pay and the amount they're the way they're treated by floyd i you know they had they see something in floyd that is is actually still beneficial now it seems like they're going with pacquiao so i don't know if floyd's thing is off the table or they're doing both of them now but yeah rising is still like like the old pride, they want they 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 like that circus thing. You know when Minoa used to always fight these huge giants. You know this they still like the circus. They still you know I almost feel like in some of their press conferences they're trying to create this um this fake uh, uh riots. I mean you know in Japan they don't do that, but recently they've been doing it a lot. So they're they're creating that. I think they're moving with the times and trying to copy the the stuff that's happening in the U.S. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, this definitely gotten bigger. It's it's in the right direction so far. Rising's doing really well. They're they're gonna move into Hawaii too soon. So um, yeah, I feel like there's they have a good momentum going. It's getting bigger. So looking forward to what Rising is gonna do in the future. I want to ask you one more thing. Did you watch Vera and Sandhagen the other night? Yeah, I did. I want to ask you about because you know people obviously UFC's biggest thing here. What did you think of Vera, Vera and Sandhagen? I know Vera was kind of, I would say he was more on the rise than Sandhagen, maybe. What did you think about the whole thing? I thought, uh, you mean the, the fight or the results? Yeah, maybe both. Yeah, well, I thought, um, yeah, well, apparently it was five against three. So it was a pretty good matchup. It, right. it was, I thought it was a, a interesting fight. I thought Sanhagen won hands down. I don't know. How, when I heard it was a split decision, I was like, holy fuck. If Sanhagen loses, I'd feel so sorry for him. But I I mean, I watched the fight. I don't know how any judge could have had uh, Sanhagen losing that fight. It's crazy, man. The, the judging is, you know, the judging in the U.S. is really scary. You don't want to leave it in their hands. What do you think about Vera? I mean, he was maybe one fight away from a title shot. Yeah, he was. Do you think yeah. he froze, or what do you think happened? No, he's a he's a slow starter from the beginning, and I I I almost feel like um, oh, oh which one, Sanhagen? No, Ver Cheeto. Oh, Vera. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I thought. Well, he's also a slow starter, right? And I thought what happened with him was I think Sanhagen was just too good. Sanhagen looked like he was a lot, a little bit, a little bit faster than him. Saying he was uh, approaching him with all different angles from the striking to the takedowns and and moving really well and 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 
coming at him in all different ways. I think it was Sanhagen that made um, Vera not as effective. So props to San Sanhagen more than wondering what happened to Vera. All right, Ensign. Well, you know, I appreciate you taking the time. You're always super cool with me doing shows. And I know you got to get to Tokyo and stuff, but it was great talking to you again and Oop. anytime. Let me know anytime, brother. All right, man. Right take care. Shoot. Right on, brother. <laughs>